sleeps, pal. Hey there, this is Pete Townsend from Norio Ventures, and this is episode 28 of Money Never Sleeps, a podcast that looks inside the head of entrepreneurs and at what makes them do what they do. Money Never Sleeps is kindly sponsored by Top Tier Recruitment, a specialist recruitment consultancy in fintech and financial services based in Dublin. In this episode, we talk to Kevin Feeney, founder and CEO of Data Chemist, who say, forget data, embrace knowledge. Owen and I both know Kevin from the things that we do, and if Kevin would let me give him a theme song, it would be all these things that I've done by the killers. Like Elaine Dehan from episode 23, it seems like all the things that Kevin's done across his career were done just at the right time in terms of the maturity, the concepts, and tech he was working with, and the level of his own curiosity about how things work. Put it all together, and you've got Kevin leading data chemist in 2018. On with the show. Here we go again. Welcome to the 28th episode of Money Never Sleeps. We're here in the Bank of Ireland Innovation Lab on Camden Street in Dublin. I'm Pete Townsend. And I'm Owen Fitzgerald. And we're here with Kevin Feeney, CEO of Data Chemist. Welcome to the show, Kevin. Thank you very much, Pete. Great to be here. Awesome to have you here. So we met last month after I was introduced to your commercial lead, who happens to be sitting here behind us for moral support. And I know he's going to keep his eye on you for the next half hour as we go through this, which is fun. So he also happens to be your brother, Luke. That's right. right. And he's friends with Ross Leonard. Shout out to Ross Leonard. I know he's a listener from Cambrist. And his CEO, Jacob Claflin, we had on episode nine, right? So the, the whole wow, small world thing kind of doesn't apply in Ireland, right? Because yeah, it's a very small world. It's a small country, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Two degrees of separation. So to kick things off, um, why don't you give us a backstory? I had a look through your profile, amazing things that you've done over the course of the last 20 years, but I'll let you tell the story, yeah? Okay, so um, I guess it comes back to, I uh, studied computer science in Trinity, uh, graduated in 98, and that was the time of the dot-com boom. I, got, I actually started out working for uh, internet companies, building um, user-generated content, uh, CMSs, content management systems. So that was a really good introduction. Uh, to like modern web tech. Uh, and I went from there to, I worked for a company called Alfira, uh, and we did uh, prepaid mobile phone uh, credit distribution through the uh, uh, credit card terminals. And this was a big thing, actually. Uh, I didn't realize, actually, at the time what a big deal it was. Uh, I was kind of naive in a business sense. But why it was really big is before that, all prepaid mobile phone credits uh, got delivered on scratch cards by trucks. And actually, what we did was we actually, in the uh, credit card terminals, they have this protocol called Apex 29B, a very old-fashioned protocol, but it has an unused space in there for advertising messages that they put into this protocol all the way back, like in the 1950s, I think, when they came up with it. And we overrode that to actually put in this message with the prepaid credit on it, and that allowed us to kind of deliver... Uh, this new service through an existing network without changing anything. So it turned out to be a, you know, a real money spinner for the guys. I didn't actually make a lot of money out of it. I was just, uh, I was the, I put the system together, but I was like uh, paid wages. And also that opened my eyes to, oh my God, next time I come up with an idea like this, <laughs> yeah. I, I want to cut to the action. <laughs> so, so that was very interesting. And then uh, I, I kind of I worked around the world. I traveled the world for a few years. I worked in Australia. I worked in New York for IBM's uh, TJ Watson Research Center, places like this. Just got a lot of experience about the world of tech. And I, I came to the conclusion if I wanted to make, uh, you know, that there, first of all, that there's huge opportunities. The, this, you know, the world is changing. People such as myself who kind of understand computers and data at scale, you can do stuff. You can do stuff on a really big mm -hmm. scale. But uh, to actually get there is very difficult. So uh, in industry, you'd never get the time. You're always dealing with the next customer, the next thing. You never get the time to kind of really you know, think afresh and how might we do this, these things better. I've always been kind of obsessed with automation, building models of systems so that we can automate a lot of the production of code. And so I went back to university and this was in the end of 2003. I was thinking, okay, you know, I'm going to put together a system and, that I can commercialize, but it ended up taking me 15 years to get to the point where I was ready to spin out, uh, which happened at the start of this year. Uh, and the critical thing there was we got a 4 million grant from the uh, European Union 
Union Horizon 2020 grant for Project Coal Alliance, which gave us the resources to build out the platform, to okay. build the tech. We had a lot of the ideas in place, but going from kind of concept to actual sellable products is quite a long journey. And, uh, uh, and I, w I mean, I know a lot of companies try and do that post funding uh, but it's you know it's uh, i wouldn't I, I you know have admiration for their chutzpah because you know it's so hard to sell a concept even if you have a product already and when you've just got an idea of a, a product and you're trying to sell that because you know when it comes down to it sales is everything if you can't sell it you're yeah. dead in startup land so so you know we were able to arrive <clears throat> into the market with something that already worked with some kind of big partners from the uh, Walters Kluwer or the University of Oxford, for example, who are already customers coming out of the academic uh, project. And that just made a, a, you know, a huge difference. We are able to, uh, we've already, you know, signed up uh, some very large uh, customers uh, commercially. And, you know, critical to that is already having that stuff in place, you know, having a working system, having software we can show people and having, you know, uh, customers that have already taken a gamble. Yeah, it's, it's amazing how it all unfolded in, in spending all the time that you did at Trinity um, and then, you know, uh, parlaying that into this research project that then you were able to parlay into a business. Yeah. Right. How does that happen? Well, I mean, it happens. I mean, the main thing was it happened because I wanted it to happen. <laughs> you know, this was always my goal. Uh, it wasn't, I mean, uh, it's not as if I understood every step, but the critical thing in doing this is knowing where you want to get to. If you know where you want to get to, then you can uh, evaluate all the opportunities and all the you know, there's always too many things you could do in this world. Uh, and you, you've got to, you need to have a kind of long-term goal to be able to evaluate those uh, and to say, well, do, does this, which of these things that I could do? Because, you know, it's technology, it's academia, there's a million things you could do. Mm -hmm. Which of these things gets me closer to the goal of having a product that I can, you know, that I can roll out and, you know, sell and and have it work, you know? So, so it was a very much a... Learning as I walked, you know, learning, uh, uh, you know, there, there's a number of significant problems. Like academia is great in terms of you can get the space to think about, you know, new ideas. Uh, but it, it's got massive challenges in terms of people in academia care about publishing. They don't necessarily care that much about engineering. So how do you get the engineering resources to go from an idea to an implemented idea, which you can show people and which works, you know? And there's not an appreciation among academics typically about, about how much work that is and how difficult it is, you know? And do you think, sorry, do you think, did it help then coming from industry first, then going into academia because you'd had the commercialized side of it and you'd seen someone commercialize a business like you're talking about on the credit card side? Yeah. Uh, Absolutely. I mean, I think that was indispensable. In fact, if I was to make a reform of the world of acad academia, I would say people should not ever go in to do PhDs or masters until they've worked in the real world for a yeah. while. Because it really, you know, it, it's. It, I remember when I was an undergraduate, before I'd really worked in the industry, you have these fanciful ideas about industry and that everything's perfect. And then when you get there, it's all basically, it, it's constant firefighting. Because you're, you know, you're always, you're always, good businesses operate at a stretch, you know, so you're always firefighting, it's always, you know, something we need to have fixed for next week, and it's critical. Uh, and, and that sense of that, you know, perfection is less important than getting it working. And there's the small things, you know, uh, are often that don't have a lot of academic interest, you know, are often the most important things, getting the buttons the right color, getting them in the right spaces, yeah. you know, people care about this stuff. Yeah. Uh, and it's work. But and you have to put the effort in, but you only see that, you know, you can only learn that by, by being there. You know what I mean? It, it, you can tell people, hey, it's like this, but, you know, until you've actually seen it and, and felt the pressure, you know, one of the one of the really learning experiences I had in that prepaid mobile phone business was one day the system broke down. OK, and it wasn't thankfully it wasn't my part of the system it was the IBM guys. OK, but uh, the CEO was there and his business was basically bleeding. A million, qu a million bucks for every hour that that system was down. It was just literally bleeding and he was losing it. And he had these IBM guys scuttling around trying to fix stuff and just the high pressure of that environment, you know, it really brings it home to you, you know, that you want to avoid those situations in the future. <laughs> and so tell us, I suppose, what does Data Chemist do then now? 
So basically, we are a company that builds enterprise knowledge graphs. And what that means is we take an organization's data, we integrate, we take out all the important uh, pieces of information with a specific focus on the relationships between entities. And we integrate that all into what we call a knowledge graph. But, but basically, where, where we have each node in the graph represents a, an entity, a person or a company, for example. And then the, we have links between these nodes, which are the relationships between them. And that might be a uh, person owns shares in company, for example, owns a certain amount of shares. And so th th that kind of basis allows you to just bring together data from lots of different databases. And then once you have it there, we can do queries and we can look for relationship patterns that are very complicated across very large data sets. So, so our, our, our kind of the work we did with Volters Kluwer, which is a Dutch German multinational involved taking uh, basically the entire commercial history of Poland since 1990s or since, you know, the, the end of the Warsaw Pact, uh, every company and person, significant person from a commercial sense, and mapping out all of their relationships, who owns shares and what, who, who's on the board of what company, and how they all related to one another. So that, so that we could, you know, and that allowed us, to, uh, allowed them to see all of these patterns, all these type of relationships that they've never been able to see before. That, you know, wh what you thought was a, a, a contract between one company and another company in fact was a contract between the, a company and the same company because there was a subsidiarity cycle and they were actually it was a subsidiary of the same company and so uh, you know for, for regulators uh, for insurers fraud. yeah for fraud this is very interesting you know oh yeah I saw it um, the guys gave me a demo last month and it, it, it knocked my socks off um, just seeing the front end of the tool of, of Data Chemist. I think you said to me that day, Kevin, that compared to, to what's actually happening behind the scenes, what you're seeing in front of you, although it looks damn cool, yeah. um, is just the tip of the iceberg, right? And that what I saw is like you're saying, now I've been telling a lot of people about this since we met, um, and I may have embellished a bit and said you guys have tokenized all of data going back to the 1400s, right? But, you know, maybe, maybe yeah. that, you know being, being part of that, but, you know, the, the idea of being able to see, okay, I've got one director in a company. Mm -hmm. um, I can then start to see this cluster effect of how many different companies they're involved with yeah. and how many different companies that their co-directors are involved with. And you start to identify some risks. And I even saw how you could even propose that a junior investment banker going to look for making up some deals um, with some prospective customers that they can start to use that as a research tool to see where the relationships are in different industries. And I thought that was pretty cool. Yeah, exactly. I mean, and it, it, so on top of our knowledge graph as well, we do kind of have standard suites of analysis we can do that are very easy to do with the graph. And one of those is the kind of similarity uh, clustering analysis. Yeah. So this is very interesting to people, for example, who are selling financial products. Let's have a look at uh, my customers and then find the most similar guys in the, in this huge big graph, the guys who have the most similar kind of sets of networks and relationships who aren't my customers because they're the guys I should go after because, you know, they share all of these attributes in common with my customers and why aren't they my customers? So uh, as a way of, you know... Uh, it, you know, the, the world is the same everywhere. There's too many things we can do. We need we need tools to help us focus our energy and kind of go, these guys are worth going after. These ones, not so much, you know? So, so it really uh, allows you to, do, to see a whole load of things that just by having all the data together and where you can uh, compare it in very fast ways. And you guys got your funding recently, uh, earlier this year. And what's next? Now that you've got something live, you've got a few customers, where are you going from here with that? So, um, so yeah, we got our, our, our seed funding from, uh, we got 1.2 million from Atlantic Bridge, uh, led by Chris Horn, which is great. Uh, they're really great partners. Uh, and, you know, Trinity are also, uh, and Enterprise Ireland are also shareholders. So, so they're all, you know, really great partners to have. But now what we're doing is actually, so we, we, first of all, we're we're you know acquiring customers we're doing POCs with a bunch of big guys uh and we are also like looking to uh, expand internationally. So this week we're actually off to New York. We're doing a I'm doing a meeting in Colombia. Uh, then the the following week we're in London. At, I'm speaking at FinTech Connect. Um, and we then through next year we're basically we're going to start our, our Series A fundraising, and that's going to bring us to we're going to have a big product uh, launch at Strata Conference in March in San Francisco. And, and, you know, and basically, so we have a twin, uh, a strategy, a twin track development. One is 
uh, the customers that, that we are going after are, are first of all, uh, you know, in, in the finance space, in uh, like very large retailers, people like this, very large manufacturers, and uh, who basically this is the very top end. These are people who've got really large uh, data problems uh, and have money to spend on it. Mm -hmm. And the second area that we're going after is basically, so people have heard a lot about knowledge graphs. People have kind of some vague idea, but almost nobody has actually tried to use a knowledge graph because typically, you know, the instructions go, okay, Step one, get a PhD in semantics or graph theory. <laughs> Step two, <laughs> and, and so they're not, there isn't a example out there of very approachable and usable ones. So we have a kind of a pared down, simplified uh, a cloud version that basically anybody can sign up to and can have free trial and, and just try it out and see it. And, and we think this is uh, going to be very important in getting that awareness out there because basically whoever is the most approachable of this type of tech gets to define what, what it is. And so there's lots of people in this kind of graph database space, uh, knowledge graph space, but uh, there's all sorts of differences between them. But what they have in common is they're all really difficult to use. So we're trying to basically, in March of next year, we bring out our simple to use. Anybody can use. You don't need to know anything. You don't need to know any special language. It's all, you know, point and click, uh, drag and drop, and so on. So, so the idea being that this is a way that we get awareness by being the easiest to use, the easiest to see what the hell this tech is about uh, product out there. And so we think, you know, those, because, because that actually takes advantage of, uh, you know, our specific advantages. Number one, we can deal with very, very big and fast. Uh, uh, problems uh, so we can go after the high end stuff but number two we have a data abstraction layer the semantic layer where you can build you build your models and what the graph looks like very much based on business objects and you don't have to care about the underlying data and, and all the messy stuff you, you just kind of have I have companies and the, these type of relationships stuff that should make sense to business users and so uh, and so it, it's a way of kind of uh, allowing people to experiment with the tech and kind of get comfortable with it without needing you know to install lots of complex software or understand graph query languages or anything like this okay okay uh, that's so changing tech slightly i suppose now that you're leading a business having gone back to the one that you didn't have any uh, a slice of what are you finding as the challenges well everything's a challenge uh, i mean businesses are complicated things there's it's like you have to care about everything uh, and you've got to kind of you don't have to be perfect in everything but you've you've got to be good enough in a lot of things and this is in terms of you know recruitment obviously in terms of you know building a culture in terms of dealing with legal and you know uh, we, we've got a, a bunch of stuff that we're patenting so we've got to deal with patent lawyers as well and all these type of things so it's just the the multifaceted nature and Ultimately, the fact that you're responsible for everything, you know, uh, there's the book stops at you. It doesn't matter, you know, how difficult it is or what troubles you have. It's your fault. So, so you know, that's a. Uh, I mean, I, I kind of enjoy that, but it is, you know, it's a, it, 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 the world is different when you're the ultimately responsible one and you can't blame anybody else. Yeah, you, you, you talked a few minutes ago, Kevin, about the how, right? And that you kind of saw a route to get this out there and to get it done and um, yeah. with a research project and then converting that into a business. What I'm interested in, though, is the why, right? And, and that are, do you see you know, uh, a, a longer term thing here um, that you can turn this into with a team, um, you know, but, but the, what's driving you personally to do this? So my personal motivation is uh, is kind of very simple. I mean, it, uh, I'm scratching my own itch. Having you know, having worked in com in you know software engineering and computers for a long, long time, we spend everybody spends way too much of their time, you know, rewriting parsing functions or parsing credit card numbers or email addresses or just low level details of the data. And it doesn't have to be like that. You know, the computers are good at that stuff. We should only be running these things once mm -hmm. and and so that we can build upon on top of that. And the, the fun stuff in computers and data is the data, it is seeing, you know, the meaningful uh, data and the trends and the patterns and all that stuff. But to get there, you got to, typically you've got to do so much low level work just to make your data line up. So, so my motivation is really trying to, trying to take that pain point away and allow 
you know, let the computers do the dumb stuff. Let the people, you know, free with the smart stuff on the top. The, uh, you know, the, the creative stuff, because uh, it's all creative, you know. How do we analyze these graphs? Like, what pieces of information we're after? What hypotheses do we want to test? And so, so really, that's my, that's my overriding uh, um, motivation is to make people make people such as myself make our lives easier by n by taking away the, the requirement to have to deal with a lot of the low level grunging of data and that's the first thing and then the second thing is just a, a general thing i mean what i learned so i worked on some big uh, open source software projects building uh, content management systems as well and there's just a great feeling of having produced something that you dreamed up that you know millions of people are using and is kind of you know that, that the world is running on and depending upon it's a great feeling of contribution yeah. when when you can do that especially you know if, if it's any good and it makes people's lives easier but 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 you know but just that feeling that y you can take your skills and your creativity and do stuff that is makes an impact upon the world yeah that's a great feeling but there's probably a fine line i suppose on that given the stories that would have come out this year on people who can use their skills around data for you know the flip side of it in a bad way and the Cambridge Analytica stuff and the Facebook like you're using your data to interpret relationships and the link between them in a positive way but clearly it's a it's a challenge as well I suppose to get people to buy into it in some ways because of the the negative side to it. Well, I mean, so from from our point of view, like most of what we're doing is is uh, business to business, it's enterprise stuff, and it's also helping them deal with their existing data sets and stuff like that. So it doesn't, you know, it doesn't come into it so much. It, there's kind of almost just uh, unallayed good in allowing businesses to function more efficiently and to, to, for them to be able to feed the data back into, you know, better evidence so that they improve. That doesn't hurt anybody. But I definitely do think, you know, looking broader, it's a huge issue for the world. I mean, the data is a powerful thing. It is possible to, you know, individual versus big data company is not an equal fight. Okay, so if you're Facebook versus your users, it's very easy for you to manipulate them in ways that is not in their best interests because you've just you've got data centers all over the world and you yeah. can run patterns and so on. So I mean, I think for broader society, this is a, a big issue. Like one of the things, uh, the ways we try and counteract this is, so Seshash is the global history data bank. And this is a project we worked on in with the European Union. But basically what we're trying to do in Seshash is is come up with data sets describing every uh, society that ever existed all the way back to 10,000 BC, all the way back to the Neolithic Revolution, and look at the factors in them as to what creates social instability, what creates, you know, what creates wars and famines, who is uh, more resilient to uh, extreme climate events. Because if you look back in that far in history, climate change has happened quite a lot. Some societies collapse, other ones don't. And to try and look at that, uh, and basically, so... You know, data is just powerful. So, so the, I don't think you can put it back in its box because whoever has the data is going to win. So what you can do is try and put data in the hands of people who have a broad social interest. So this is a whole lot of, of social scientists, people who are really, you know, they, they're, they're not in it for money. They're not trying to make you click on ads. They're using data to kind of see, well, how can we make our societies more resilient? And to me, that's the most realistic thing, you know, way that we as a society can, can counteract the problems is by just making sure that, you know, some of the, these data and resources are not only in the hands of people who are just trying to make money out of them. There's nothing wrong with making money, obviously, but, you know, as, uh, the, but also to basically people who are caring about broader things, longer, longer term things as well. One, one, uh, one of the th th things I said earlier was that I thought I did embellish by saying you go back to the 1400s, but you go way back before <laughs> yeah. that. Right? 10,000 BC. <laughs> um, you know, I, the way I look at some of these things is that, you know, my mindset will jump right to the financial markets, the financial services when I see something, right? And I say, how can it be useful for that? Um, and what I love about what you guys are doing is that it is applicable across so many different verticals. Right. And that you've proven that already with a research project around that. Um, what this brings to mind is just kind of your role. Right. As one of the guys from Fundrax, Alan Meany, he'll always say to entrepreneurs, he said, listen, when you're getting your business going, it's so important to have a technical co-founder. Right. Someone who will stay up until two in the morning worrying about how to make sure things look right. Kevin, you are the technical 
co-founder, right? Yeah. How do you, as with your long history at the very coal face of all of the tech side of things, how do you balance that um, from from a, a founder perspective? Well, I mean, the best way always is hiring good people and having good people around you. So, so my, so actually, even though I am the technical co-founder or a technical co-founder, my CTO Gavin, who uh, founded the company with me, is I would consider him to be the world's greatest computer scientist. He's just he's amazing. He thinks about okay. these things all the time. He never turns off from worrying about scale. He loves and parallelism, and so he just. I, so a lot of the things I just don't have to worry about because I know Gavin is worried about. And also then Luke, who we brought on, we poached him from the Department of Foreign Affairs. He was actually his his, his most uh, recent role was acting ambassador to or he was acting ambassador to Greece. And then he was uh, government press secretary for Brexit. So actually, um, it's an interesting thing. Uh, diplomacy and uh, enterprise software sales are kind of almost the same thing. Yeah. It, it, they're very, you're dealing with large organizations. You're trying to kind of figure out how they work you're trying to get to the right people you're trying to build positive relationships with them so Luke then has, has just been amazing he's come on board and really you know, so there's a whole range of things I used to have to worry about that I don't anymore so actually as we go it's kind of it's it's getting easier for me because there's less things that I have to worry about uh, because somebody else has got them, you know? And so I can actually think more now about like long-term strategic stuff, uh, cultural stuff. Um, so, you, which, you know, really it, it's just, I mean, that's what building a team is all about. Basically finding people who may, who allow you to worry less about things. Oh yeah. And any specific experiences you, you've had so far, just say in the last year, even where you said, wow, that worked. I ne- I'd never thought of that. I'm going to do more of that. Um, yeah, I mean, um, I guess uh, th- there's a lot of those type of experiences because yeah. we're always experimenting and trying uh, stuff out. So, for example, one uh, like one of our really uh, our uh, software engineers on database side, he's uh, he's working remotely, for example, and we didn't know if this was going to work. Uh, he's he's in the Netherlands, and uh, all of these things are risks. But like I traveled over to that uh, to the Netherlands to meet him and got a sense of him and kind of got just got a feeling this is this will work. He's got the you know he's got the drive. He's got the commitment to make it happen, and it did. You know he's working out great. So everything along the way is kind of experimental, and you, some things don't work, and some things you know obviously work, and you don't expect them to, or you don't know in advance. Cool. Um, so I suppose we've probably come t- to the end, I think, in terms of <laughs> what we can cover in this episode, although there's huge amounts I'd love to ask. I, I did a lot of work in data with future finance around predicting um, future affordability of students. So we spent okay. a lot of time on yeah. data and automating it, and I found it fascinating. Yeah. Probably one of the most, most enjoyable jobs, purely seeing can people repay things in 10 years' time based on no yeah. information now. But um, what is something that people wouldn't expect to know about you? What they would not expect to know about me, uh, I once uh, travelled from uh, the westernmost point of Africa uh, in Senegal, in Dakar, to Cape Town by public transport. (laughs) Wow. (laughs) How long did that take? That took about 13 months. Whoa. (laughs) Was that just out of pure desire or circumstance? Desire, yeah. I just wanted to see what it was like. Wow. (laughs) How long ago was that? That was in (laughs) 2000. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah, you might as well. I'm still right? alive. <laughs> <laughs> and any particular dangerous spots along the way? Yeah, I would avoid Central African Republic. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And generally, yeah, it's yeah, not a, not a great holiday destination. Okay. <laughs> you, you, we 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 could talk about uh, potential future customers coming from Central African Republic. <laughs> yeah. Probably <laughs> they need stage. they need more basic infrastructure. Okay. I think. <laughs> All right. I'm sure we could provide them with some data sets. Yeah. Oh yeah. All right. Absolutely. <laughs> All right. Well, great. Thanks for coming on the show, Kevin. Really appreciate it. My pleasure. Great Thanks to have you. Me. Fascinating great. story. Thanks. So that wraps things up for this episode. But hang on. We'd like to thank Kevin for opening up his mind for the 28th episode of Money Never Sleeps, a podcast brought to you by Norio Ventures and Owen Fitzgerald and sponsored by Top Tier Recruitment. You can find out more about Kevin by following him on Twitter at CheckoffF, that is C-H-E-K-O-V-F, and by checking out the Data Chemist website on datachemist.com. 
If you like what you heard today, please subscribe to Money Never Sleeps on Transistor.fm, iTunes, Spotify, or on your favorite online media channel and leave us a review. Each one helps. You can now access all the Money Never Sleeps episodes through a link on the podcast page of the Norio Ventures website, which is norioventures.com. If you're an entrepreneur with a story to tell anywhere in the world, drop us a line using the contact form the Norio Ventures website. Besides this podcast, we help founders build their ventures. So check out norioventures.com to learn more and get in touch. Finally, we'd like to thank Conan Brophy from Create Sound for recording and editing this podcast. And thanks to the Bank of Ireland Innovation Lab for hosting us and for all that they do for the startup community in Ireland. Till next time, thanks for listening. See ya!